Uh, camp cooking. It's one of those topics that I get asked about a lot, perhaps more than anything else, uh, other than maybe solar, uh, because I mention cooking periodically and some of the things I do. And I think there's often an idea that camp cooking means a uh, really difficult experience or that is you're really limited in what you can do. And the truth is that, at least in my experience, I can cook almost anything in a camp kitchen, whether that's in the van or set up at an outside table like I have today, that I can cook almost anything there that I could cook in a house. Um, one limitation I have right now is I don't have an actual camp oven, uh, but I improvise, and, and it's not quite the same, but I can get by. But you can also get a camp oven that, that you know, uh, of several different styles. The easiest thing is one of those little Coleman ovens that sits on the burner of your stove. And that allows you to, uh, again, it's, it's smaller, but you can cook, uh, you can bake things that you like you would normally at home. So really you can do just about anything you would do at home uh, <coughs> on the road, whether you're doing it in the van or, or outside. Uh, outside will give you more room, make it easier to work in many cases. If you're in a minivan like I am, um, you just only got just so much space to work with. You have to do it seated. And so getting outside allows me to stretch out a little bit. Well, hey, everybody. Still hanging out waiting for the eclipse. Meanwhile, today, our friend Mary Jane brought us a whole bunch of fresh organic vegetables out of her garden, including some this uh, chocolate mint. So I just had to put it to some good use. I actually have a few plans for that chocolate mint, including going to try it in a bottle of water for just some uh, chocolate mint water. And I'm also going to try some chocolate mint tea. But for this afternoon, uh, getting back to some work after a little break, I decided I'm going to make up a cup of chocolate mint coffee. That yeah, is smelling really good already. And Deborah tells me she is in a hurry to try this out as well. Meanwhile, I'm an old Yankee, so I like to do dishes like pickle lily. And uh, my grandmother used to make that. I have fond memories of that. And so with some of the food that came along today, I decided I just had to make some pickle lily. Uh, we had, oh gosh, Mary Jane brought us cucumbers and green beans and uh, eggplant and uh, boy, peaches. And of course the chocolate mint. And I think a few other things I'm forgetting. Some oh tomatoes. Uh, so we're all stocked up on produce here. Meanwhile, I got the pickle lily started cooking here. So that should be really good. We're going to try that out for dinner. So I'll let you know how that goes. It's also fun because we're camped here right now with another uh, view viewer, uh, and, and now a friend, uh, Linda. Linda actually headed up from Colorado not too long ago, and we met her in Gillette as a meetup. Um, so that was pretty uh, pretty cool. We've uh, been hanging out a bit off and on uh, in, in a few weeks since then. Uh, she and Deborah have gone camping several times as well. Uh, so she was here when Mary Jane brought up food, so we got to uh, share between the three of us all this wonderful bounty, uh, fresh out of the garden produce. I don't always get all this stuff out when I'm doing some outdoor cooking. I got it out this morning to show you what I have and what I use. Uh, what are some of the essentials? Uh, this table here is an essential for, or something like it, is basically an essential for outdoor cooking. <clears throat> if you don't have a table, you're basically limited to uh, campgrounds that have uh, picnic tables, or or you're limited to using like the trunk of your vehicle or something like that. So a table. Is really helpful. Uh, I did not have this at first when I started on the road. I was in a Toyota Camry and uh, you know basically I'd have to open the trunk and you cook on a plastic box or tote in the trunk. And that was not real convenient. So I finally found this one. It took me a while to find one as small as this. Uh, this is like a $30 folding table from Walmart. It folds in half right here and then the legs fold up and it's it so it's pretty flat, and it goes right into the tr went right into the trunk of the car, and now it goes into the you know right into the minivan. Obviously, you have to have a stove or some way to cook as well. Uh, this is a Coleman butane stove. I've used several different stoves on the road. Uh, I started with one of those cheap uh, bottle top propane ones. That was awful. I know a few people use those long term. Most people I know get rid of them really quick, and that was my experience. Very difficult to cook on and uh, just just tipsy and not stable and the pot likes to slide off it and not something I would recommend in any way for uh, serious cooking. 
I don't recommend it, period, but definitely not for serious cooking. I also had, uh, let's see, let's, <laughs> I just got distracted. I just looked over, there's a couple cows standing over here. <laughs> All right. Oh, man, <laughs> they're coming for breakfast, I guess. Uh, I've also used um, a Texport uh, propane stove. I've used a uh, bottle top butane stove that was much better than the propane one because it's lower and it was a little wider. Um, but I recently upgraded this one and I really like this stove. The reason is basically the form factor is low and flat, it's stable, it's not tipsy. Uh, the butane cartridges go in here. Uh, I've got a few more out here this morning. Um, <clears throat> standard butane fuel. These actually come in a couple different sizes. This is the size you use for this stove. The bottle top stoves use a different uh, canister. These actually come in a couple different dimensions. Uh, this is the one you use for this stove, uh, but there's also a <clears throat> shorter squatter canister in two different sizes that you use for these little bottle top stoves. And this just screws onto this is the wrong bottle, but to illustrate, it just screws onto the top of the bottle like that. Uh, but in the case of these stoves, it's, it's, the cans are, you know, shorter and much wider. Then they're the ones that are popular with backpackers. Now, there's a debate <coughs> between butane and propane. And I'm not going to tell you what to do. You do whichever one works best for you. Uh, propane is the most popular, to be certain. Uh, there are a few ideas, or basically a few objections to butane. The first is that... Butane generally doesn't light under 32 degrees. And generally, that is true. <clears throat> but the bottom line is, if my van's below 32, I'm probably going to be turning on a heater in the morning anyways. And if not, I'll just stick it inside my... I can stick this inside my jacket, you know, or inside my sleeping bag for a bit before I go to bed in the morning. And then it'll warm up enough. That's what backpackers do. So it's not a big deal. Because um, I'm generally traveling in the weather. If I was spending all winter somewhere that was super cold and... Uh, didn't have heat then you know I might think about that more as a concern uh, another objection to butane is that it's more expensive than propane I don't know that that's strictly true uh, it's, it's hard to get an exact comparison but if you really do the math on it carefully um, these cans for example are 8.8 .8 ounces you can get them for about eh, 250 or three bucks at Walmart depending on on the day and on the town you're in uh, the 16 ounce propane cylinder uh, which weighs tw twice as much as this, uh, you know, is, is going to run you about three fifty or four bucks at Walmart. So it seems like oh, you're going to pay you know five or six bucks for seventeen ounces of this, and you can get sixteen ounces of propane for less, you know, for, for uh, you know what, what's that run out to you know three fifty four bucks. The catch is these things, these cans, the tear weight in these cans is super light. Um, but the propane, if you ever, even if you compare it, an empty cylinder, an empty steel cylinder, they're much thicker walled and it's steel, they're much heavier. So they're not, um, when you actually compare the amount of gas you're getting, you're not getting uh, 17 ounces of gas versus 16 ounces of gas with a propane because you're just not, you know, there's not that much of a difference because the canister is much heavier. So I think it averages out. So you're not actually, there's not actually that much of a price difference. The other thing with butane is this burns hotter. Your propane stoves are going to run 5,000 to 7,000 BTUs usually, whereas your butane stoves are usually going to run 7,000 to 10,000 BTUs. So you're using less fuel to cook. So I think it probably averages out pretty close when you really sit down and do the math on it. And, you know, honestly, even if this is a little bit more expensive, it's not like massively more expensive. We're talking about cooking fuel, not heating, where you really go through it. So this, this canister right here lasts for an hour and 15 minutes on high. You know, if, it caught, if it's 25 cents a can more at the end of the day to use a stove that's a much nicer design and works better for me, and cooks hotter than uh, propane, then I'm okay with that. Uh, the other thing with this stove is it's got a much better temperature control. You can bring it from really hot boiling down to a simmer, which you can't really do with most propane stoves. Most propane stoves are, you know, they don't go as low as the stove does. So that's a nice thing. Um, the other thing, because this thing is cheap. I don't know how they do it. 18 bucks at Walmart. Uh, I have no idea how they sell it that cheap. Um, but it's not expensive. You can get a version of these stoves. The canister goes in here uh, uh, and just locks in place. You can get a version of these stoves that's dual fuel 
and you can run either these butane canisters or they'll run on propane and they have a hole here and they run a hose in through and connects here and that's a cool option they run 50 or 50 dollars i think from the ones i've seen but the catch with the dual fuel stoves is that means you're then carrying around a larger propane cylinder which will definitely lower your fuel cost because then when you're talking propane if you can if you're using a refillable larger tank is definitely cheaper than than portable the one pound cylinders or the butane the problem is i don't have room to lug around a tank like that so i'm using butane and it's working well for me a lot of people do um the other thing with butane that can be a concern for some people is that it can be a little harder to find these canisters you can get them in any walmart but sometimes they're sold out or sometimes they're low uh and if you do get into if you don't stock up ahead of time if you get into some little uh country store in the middle of nowhere you may have a hard time finding them or if you do find them they'll definitely will be more expensive um, so whereas the one pound propane you can find anywhere so if you're going to use these like i do i would recommend you stock up on them while you're in town and make sure you have enough to get you through until after your next trip to walmart um, so there's the stove you gotta have a stove there's a couple of ways you can cook i'm not getting into in this in this video because this is what most people are going to do in my experience is some kind of a camp stove you can also cook on fire we have a nice little fire pit over there but we're, we have we have fire restrictions here in wyoming right now so i cannot uh, demonstrate that for you and we also can cook like in a solar oven that's something i haven't actually done yet but it's definitely on my list to get around to trying uh, i think that'll be fun for baking and things so i will be getting around to that and I'll, of course i'll share a video on that when i when i start doing it uh, <clears throat> you need some pots i've been through a few different pots and pans uh you know, when I started out, I was in the car, so I had like some basic stuff. I just brought from home. When I went into the trailer, I had a full, uh, a full kitchen. You know, I had a, a five-foot kitchen counter with a two-burner stove and a sink, and and I had lots of different uh, dishes and, and pots and pans, and I could cook a griddle. I could cook anything in there. One of the things I find with uh, even on a decent stove like this is a lot of pots and pans that are designed for kitchens will tip over because they're designed to sit on a flat stove. Uh, so they'll tip over because the handles are too heavy so you have to watch out for that and i also i had a teflon pot about this size uh for a while and i was cooking rice and beans one day this spring and i went to do dishes afterwards and realized the teflon was coming off the bottom of the pan and apparently i'd eaten it with my rice and beans so i swore off teflon after that so what i've got right now is an iron skillet it'll stand by um, <clears throat> i like iron i'm just getting back to this in the van so we'll see how it goes um you know, we'll see how that works out. And I've got these uh, stainless steel pots. These are nesting pots. I've replaced my Teflon one with these. And uh, basically, th this th this is actually not part of the set. This is just a, you know, a uh, standard $6 steel cup uh, with folding handles. But it fits right in here perfectly. And I do use it to like boil water for coffee and things like that. And then it's got two of these pots. And each one has handles that fold out. And they're insulated so you don't burn your hands when you're cooking which is really nice um now i'll leave this out because i actually got to make some coffee this morning in a minute uh, but these, this uh, pot set this, this is five or six bucks at walmart this is i think this was 10 bucks at walmart it's not it's stainless it's not the soup highest quality you could find but you know for nesting camp where it works and you can definitely get nicer stuff at an rei or a Cabela's and something like that, but you're going to pay a little more for it, too. Um, so, you know, I've also got a bowl. I have a plate somewhere. I can't find it this morning. Just a regular plastic plate. This is a little bowl that came with that nest with that uh, uh, Teflon pot I had before, and it's got a lid on it, which is kind of nice. I mostly I just use it as a bowl, but sometimes I want to put stuff in the cooler with this. Um, some basic, uh, you know, a few utensils. Um, of course, I have my thermos. I'll be using that to make coffee with this morning. What I've gotten to with coffee is I almost always will do it in the thermos rather than in my coffee cup because this makes the equivalent of two cups of coffee in my travel mug. So I use that a lot. Um, got to have a way to clean up. So, you know, I got a couple spray bottles. I'll put a link to Deborah's video where she shows how she does dishes with these. I'm not as detailed as she is, but she's the one who turned me on to the spray bottle idea. And I have a cutting board. You can just do that on a table too if you want, but it's really handy for cutting vegetables and stuff. Uh, one of the things you're going to want to do if you've got uh, if you're indoors, probably you're going to want a screen, a uh, windscreen or heat deflector. And so this is a DIY one I put together. It makes a big, big difference when you're cooking outside to be able to wrap that around the stove because it stops the wind. Uh, 
from blowing through on a bad windy day it'll blow your flame out but even if it's only moderately windy it takes a lot longer to cook because it carries the heat away um, so it's, it's definitely worth using one of those if you're cooking inside the van i put a link on my public facebook page today about a guy who's uh stove got camp stove got knocked over in his pickup truck uh, during the morning of the eclipse and burned the truck to the ground um, you got to be really careful cooking inside and that's that's I, ho I hope everybody's careful with that um, i'm a little paranoid in the van here in the minivan because uh, i don't have uh, the way my curtains are is just really easy to there we go lift second now it also has an electric ignition on it, which is really nice. Um, so don't mind me. I'm just getting my coffee going while we chat here this morning. Um, but you have to be really careful. And using a heat shield allows you to keep the heat confined around the pot and around the stove rather than escaping out and potentially lighting your curtains or your, your fabric or bedding or whatever else on fire in your van, which would obviously be a bad day for everybody around. So that's something to be careful with. The other thing with, this, with the using a heat shield around here, is that it keeps the heat concentrated uh, in addition to not letting it go away it keeps it concentrated so it does cook faster um, i'm just leaving it off this morning because it's a better visual you don't want to look at the back of a heat shield while i cook my coffee uh, but that's most of what i've got for my gear here uh, as far as as uh, that's the basics now you can do what works for you oh i forgot to mention the spice box though uh, you know, these are these are all my spices. Um, I used to carry them in a Ziploc bag, but I've got this nifty little box now that fits on the shelf that you're going to see when I do the van tour video coming up real soon. So I just reorganized that for the third time. Um, so I just keep that handy. And I, again, I can grab one or two things if I know what I'm looking for, or I can just grab the whole box and bring it out if I'm cooking. Um, you know, just having some basic spices makes a huge difference uh, when it comes time to cook. I'm kind of a coffee snob, kind of. Not as bad as I can. I do this in a French press, ideally, but it's too hard to clean up on the road. So, I always buy halfway decent coffee. This is a Starbucks Italian roast, probably my favorite Starbucks one. I do buy uh, smaller roasters too. Uh, this is just what I happen to get at Walmart. As far as seasoning, though, real quick, um, I have some chopped onion. I prefer real onions, but I like to get the boiling onions because they're little, and I can use one or two for a meal. I'm aware of refrigerating the other one. Uh, the rest of it. Uh, some garlic powder. Again, I prefer real garlic, but right now I've got powder. Uh, Montreal steak seasoning is my default standby pepper. Uh, and a few other things in there. Um, this is interesting. Uh, Deborah picked this up um, when she was in New Mexico at a, a site there. I've got these from a native vendor, and I brought a few to me. This is a salsa mix that's really good, but this one... They call this Chimayo Twist Mix. It's a mix of a whole bunch of different seasonings. It's uh, spicy. It's, it's, it's hot. It's a hot seasoning. Really good, though. I use it in soups, scrambled eggs, that kind of thing. So, uh, But I'm rationing it because I like it so much, I don't want to run out of it. And it'll probably be a while till I'm down in that area of New Mexico to replace it. So, <laughs> so I'm kind of rationing. Um, but you can do pretty much, as I said, you can do pretty much anything you want to do while you're... Uh, in a camp kitchen there there are a couple caveats a couple things to keep in mind though uh, the first i think is patience dirty little secret of van life that a lot of people won't tell you when they're instagramming or putting out their awesome van life videos is that everything in van life is harder and it takes longer um, my, my friend Deborah refers to it as pioneer living and i just cannot think of a better description than that except for our wagons have engines and air conditioning uh, so we don't hook up the horses and sweat quite as much when we're driving we sweat when we're not driving but there's a lot of similarities there and we're doing things uh you know everything just takes longer but i think it's worth it I'm, it's not a complaint i'm just telling you everything takes longer so when you're cooking everything takes longer uh you have to get stuff out so preparation takes longer uh washing dishes cooks longer uh cooking sometimes takes longer if you do all the wind or rain or whatever you know it's just everything takes longer because you don't have uh your setup at home or you know so it does take a little longer so you have to have some patience uh to do camp cooking uh because it's just going to take a little longer especially until you get the hang of it it does get a little you do get a little more efficient the second one is preparation and i, I kind of showed you that this morning by getting a few things out and having everything ready um that's that helps make the process better and makes it easier when you're in your house you've got everything in a 
arm's reach. You know, everything's in a cabinet or a drawer or the refrigerator. And when you're in a van, you know, unless you're cooking in the van and have everything handy in the van, uh, even for a lot of us in the van, things are put away and so we have to get them out. So if you start cooking and you don't have everything out, you have to move things around and, and it can be frustrating. If you're cooking like this, if you don't have everything ready, you have to keep running back to the van to get more stuff. So preparation adds up. So patience, preparation, and thirdly, because I ran out of alliterative uh, examples, creativity. I couldn't help with a P for that. Creativity, uh, a lot of times you got to improvise. Um, I'm an improv cook anyways. I don't. I, I just don't even, you know, I like to make everything up. It's fun for me. It's kind of a hobby. Uh, but you got to be creative when you're doing camp cooking because you're not always going to have all the ingredients you got at home or all the stuff. Or maybe you ran out of milk because you could only carry a half gallon or a quart or whatever. Or maybe your milk spoiled and it's 30 miles to town to get more. So you have powdered milk to use. I use that for baking and stuff. Um, or, you know, maybe you got to figure out how to improvise to make an oven. Uh, so you can bake something. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, you have to exercise some creativity, find different ways to do stuff, find ways to, experimental ways to cook things a little bit differently than you would at home. So if you exercise some patience and some uh, preparation and some creativity, I think honestly think you can cook just about anything out here on the road, in a forest, in the desert, that you would cook at home. Um, examples, just the other day, I, I made, uh, made a good breakfast with omelets and uh you know with, with uh chopped peppers and cheese and and some other seasonings in there uh tomatoes uh do it fresh diced up tomatoes uh later in the day i made pickle lily homemade pickle lily right in the camp um not too far from here um <clears throat> i also made uh some really good uh green beans that day i parboiled them up in one of these pots and then i put them in a skillet with a little bit of oil and garlic and uh I think Montreal steak seasoning actually, and that came out really good. Uh, so really good, you know. <laughs> so you can, uh, oh yeah. And then we was added one some protein, so I threw some leftover chicken fajita that I'd had in the cooler in this bowl right here. That's the leftover chicken fajita meat, and you know threw that in there for uh, to make some protein. To eat that as a side with it. You can do all kinds of stuff, honestly. Um, back this last winter. I made full Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners. I was in the trailer at the time, so that was a little bit easier. But I was in a, a converted cargo trailer. You know, it wasn't like a fancy RV or anything. I didn't have an oven. Um, how did I do that? Well, I did my vegetables in several shifts on the stove and then wrapped them in, you know, put them in t bowls with tinfoil on them to keep them warm. Uh, turkey, I used uh, sliced turkey breast and made homemade stuffing and put that in, wrapped that in had two layers of heavy tin foil, put it on a little gas grill that I had outside. Uh, so you can do, uh, you know, oh, I made homemade cranberry sauce for that, uh, homemade applesauce. So, you know, you, you really, that definitely took some preparation, okay? That was, uh, you know, that was getting everything ready the night before and spending all morning cooking, but it was worth it. Uh, it was fun. So you can do that, uh, just about anything you want to do out here. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't making videos back Thanksgiving and Christmas, or else I'd be glad I could show you some clips from that. But, um, I, I was editing videos, but I wasn't making my own at that point. So, um, But my coffee is, water is just about ready for coffee here, so I'm going to go ahead and make this. I hope this gave you some ideas for how to get set up so you can cook uh, a decent meal at camp. Uh, I'll try and do some more videos in the coming months on actual meals I'm doing to show you what I'm doing but this is the basics of it and it just really isn't that bad once you get the hang of it a little bit but like I said some patience definitely will go a long ways because it does take a little longer and some uh, preparation you know it, that, that pays off in spades when I f first got in the minivan for example I wasn't very organized and I get everything out I thought I needed I had like my stove was in one box and food was in another box and, and so I had to get everything out I thought I was ready and then I start cooking and realize I forgot something and I have to turn the stove off and move the pot somewhere safe and move the stove and climb back in to get something out and it was just a pain so you don't want to deal with all that and so if you're if you're able to uh, prepare a little bit ahead of time that will uh, make that experience that much easier. Um, and creativity, sometimes you just gotta do stuff different ways or make stuff up or may improvise how you make a recipe or improvise how you're preparing something, uh, but you can do it. So, you know, I encourage you to, to uh, 
you know, give it a try, be, give yourself uh, permission to make some mistakes as you experiment and learn, but it can be fun and you can be rewarding and you can make some really good meals uh, out here on the road. And you know, the only option really is eating like ramen or peanut butter sandwiches or eating out at restaurants all the time. Those aren't really great options, I don't think. So, um, you know, take a little inspiration here. I'll start trying to include some uh, cooking videos to show how I'm doing some different meals and how they turn out. And hopefully that will uh, be helpful to those of you who are, are newly getting on the road or are trying to figure out this whole camp cooking thing because it is a little different. It really is. Uh, it's different than being at home. So... But meanwhile, my coffee is just about done here, and I'm itching for a cup because it's time. So I hope this video gave you some ideas to help you get started with this stuff. And thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video, everybody.